Today, I've traveled over to Augusta, Georgia, known for its rich Civil War history, and they have the Masters Tournament here. Unfortunately, I picked a rather bad day to come do this one because I don't know if you can see it well through the camera, but it's raining on top of me. If you can't see the rain coming down, I'm surely you can see it on my shirt, but I've came all the way here, so we're going to deal with it. I'm here today in Augusta for a story, and the story is very convoluted, and man, it's a wild one. First off, I need to thank Georgia Constitution Media for sending this one to me because it's a doozy. Back in 2009, a woman was found dead in her home. At first, law enforcement believed that it was a home invasion gone wrong, but then the home right next door to hers was also robbed. And it was all very strange and investigators started scratching their heads trying to figure out what happened so they they started digging deeper into the situation and it took a sharp turn out into left field and no one saw it coming this story today is the case of a cold-blooded murder adultery and an unlikely killer that you won't see coming this is the murder of laverne parsons Today, as I said, I am in Augusta, Georgia. I'm actually in the downtown area, and man, is it beautiful down here. Well, those people got it made over there. Nice houses right on the river. 41-year-old Laverne K. Parsons. She went by K. She was born in 1968, and she grew up in Pennsylvania. K would actually go on to marry her high school sweetheart, whose name was David Parsons. After high school, David joined the military and Kay faithfully followed him all around, everywhere he went. Kay was a devoted military wife and in the early 2000s, David would be stationed at Fort Gordon in Georgia, which is here near Augusta. And they loved it so much that in 2005, David left the military and he and Kay decided to settle down and start a family. And they chose to do that here in Augusta. David and Kay moved right here into this home. They had a son together that they named Derek and Kay worked at a nearby physical therapy office. And she loved her job and she loved her life. Kay was the team mom for Derek's baseball team. She participated in Derek's school functions and PTA, and all three of them were dedicated to their faith, attending the neighborhood's Church of Christ. Kay was very friendly. She made friends with a few of the moms from her son's baseball team. She made some friends with a few of the moms at the school, and she was good friends with all of her neighbors. In fact, her best friend lived right next door in this house right here. Everyone in this neighborhood was so close that they frequently had backyard neighborhood cookouts. One summer, all of the moms from this whole neighborhood, they took a week long cruise together. That's just how close they were. Now, this neighborhood here where they lived, it was very quiet and everyone got along with each other. It was one of those communities where the people they all decorated for Halloween and for Christmas and the children were allowed to be out in the street playing and riding around on their bicycles. It could literally have come straight out of a movie. All of a sudden though, out of nowhere, March of 2009 would happen and this community would never be the same. On March the 25th of 2009, David was gone to California on a business trip. Kate and Derek were at home doing their normal routine and early that morning a construction worker who was coming by the home here to do some repairs he arrived here at about 8 30 a.m and he knocked on the front door he got no answer so this construction worker walked around to the back of the house where he was going to be doing the work that day and while he was walking around the back he tried to call Kay parsons on the phone and yet again he got no answer as he got around to the back door of the home, 
he saw that one of the glass doors on the French doors on the back of the house, one of those glass doors was busted out and there was glass everywhere. So fearing that the home had been robbed, the construction worker calls 911 and reports it. An emergency 911. Yes, I'm over here at uh, 229 um, um, Cold Springs, uh -huh. and the back door's broke in, and I had come over here to do some work, and uh, and uh, I just walked around the back because I had some talking to do, and the, the stuff's broke in. I mean, this back glass is flattered out and everything. Oh, right. I'd like to get the police over here. Okay. I called the owner, but she's not here. Um, I don't think if, if she's gone, um, I mean, I... I hollered at the end of the door uh -huh. and I did, get no response. Yeah, I don't want you to go in, honey. All right, I'll get them on over there, honey. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. After he called 911, he went and, like, he tried to step in to the home so that he could call out for Kay and make sure she didn't need help. And when he stuck his head in, he immediately saw blood laying all over the floor. So he quickly backed out and waited for the police officers to show up. It was at this point, one of... Kay's friends, her best friend, her next door neighbor, this neighbor walks up to the construction worker with her son and they ask the construction worker what he's doing and what's going on and the construction guy quickly tells this neighbor that he doesn't know, he didn't break the back door, he just walked up on it that way and he tells him that he's already called police but that it looks like something bad has happened in the home. When law enforcement arrived here at the home, they made entry and they immediately walked into a grisly, grisly crime scene that they weren't expecting. As they went through the home, searching room by room, they followed a trail of blood through the home and they eventually discovered Kay Parsons laying on the floor here inside of this garage. She was alive, but she was unconscious and she was barely breathing. Kay had suffered many blunt force traumas to her head and to her body. Within minutes, Kay was rushed to a local hospital here in Augusta and immediately put into a critical care unit. At the same time, here at the Parsons home, police were still investigating and they assessed and marked off the crime scene. They found blood splatter all over the inside of the house and the house was completely destroyed. Kay's purse was laying on the living room floor and there was an empty coffee cup laying on the floor dumped out as if someone had been caught off guard and they were startled so they spilled it everywhere while the officers were searching the home they did find a bloody hammer and a bloody baseball bat that appeared to be the weapons used in the attack on k parsons in the home there was bloody handprints all over the place they picked up several bloody fingerprints that they were able to lift and then they tried to match those up to their fingerprint database but they got no hits to investigators all signs pointed to a home invasion robbery gone bad. It appeared as if Kay probably walked in and interrupted them, and that's why she was attacked. Now, Kay stayed in the ICU in critical condition all through the rest of that day and the night on March 25th, but unfortunately, the following day on the 26th, she would succumb to her injuries, and Laverne Kay Parsons passed away at the age of 41 years old. To further cement in the detective's minds that this was a robbery gone wrong, David flew home from California and he was able to determine that a very expensive gold necklace and an expensive watch were missing from his wife's jewelry cabinet. Law enforcement scoured the Parsons home for clues and for evidence. They walked the whole neighborhood here and they asked all the neighbors if they had seen anything or heard anything suspicious and remarkably, they got nothing. No one heard a sound, no one saw anything out of the ordinary, and everyone who knew Kay told the detectives that this was absolutely baffling to them. They knew of no one who would want to hurt her. And they told them that she had no enemies that anyone knew of. Again, this had to be a home invasion gone wrong. That theory was cemented even more in their minds after law enforcement left, after they did all their investigating and they left. The neighbor, Kay's best friend, the woman who lived right here in this home, her name was Rebecca Sears. She was married also, but she and her husband were separated at the time, and she lived right here in this home with her son, Christopher Bowers, and four other children. Well, after they found Kay and they did all their investigating and they left, she also called 911 and reported that her home had been burglarized now. Officers who had just been out here in the neighborhood, they 
quickly return and they enter Rebecca Sears home with their guns drawn and once they get inside just like in the Parsons home this home too was tossed and turned and completely ransacked again the only things missing were a few items of jewelry just like in the Parsons home the only difference was that this time no one was hurt the detectives immediately began investigating under the assumption that the two burglaries were connected. I mean, how could they not be? Any detective will tell you that when it comes to investigations like this, they don't believe in coincidences. So they went on believing that these two were related. For a couple of days after this, they're working on the case and they're trying to figure out who could have done this. So they pull all of the family's cell phone data and their GPS data, just trying to get everything in order. Law enforcement came up with theories that maybe the burglar initially hit the wrong house. So maybe they came back to hit Rebecca Sears' house. But then again, who would have the balls to hit one house and then kill someone in cold blood and come back and hit the neighbor's house? It just didn't make sense to law enforcement. The only thing that they could all agree on was that these two robberies had to be related somehow. Now, Rebecca Sears, Kay Parsons' best friend, both of them actually worked at the same physical therapy office, this office right here. They worked in different areas and they had like different days off and stuff like that, but it added another piece to this puzzle. It seemed odd to them that not only did they live right next door to each other and they worked in the same office together, but then both of their houses get burglarized together on the same day and Kay gets murdered. Now, if this story isn't crazy enough already, just a few days after Kay died, Rebecca calls 911 again, this time from the physical therapy office where she worked. As Rebecca was walking out of the front door of the office here, an unknown person ran up to her, they demanded money from her, and then they shot her in the leg. That's the 911. Somebody came out from behind the trees and he shot me. Do you know where you did it? Uh, my leg. What's the name of the office? It's Healing Hands Physical Therapy. What's your name? Becky Sears. Rebecca Sears was rushed to a local hospital, but her injuries were not life-threatening, and they were actually just somewhat superficial. So she was quickly treated and released. It's at this point, the whole thing takes a huge turn out into left field when the detectives get all of the data back from everyone's cell phones. As the detectives go through all of the cell phone data, call logs, GPS location pings, and text messages and all this, they uncover that for several years, Rebecca Sears and Kay's husband, David Parsons, had unbelievably been having an affair behind Kay's back, and she never knew it. Rebecca's husband had no clue. They managed to keep it a secret from everybody, which is shocking as close as Rebecca and Kay were. In the text message law enforcement recovered from Rebecca and David's phones, they discovered that just weeks before Kay's murder, Rebecca Sears gave David Parsons an ultimatum. She told him that he has to choose between her or his wife, she texted him, begging and pleading with him to leave Kay. She told him that she loves him and she can't go on without him. All while he's married to her neighbor, her co-worker, and her best friend, it's a complete mess. Detectives also learn from their text messages that a month prior, when she gave him that ultimatum, the two of them supposedly cut off the affair. But they also saw where the two of them were still talking and they had even had phone sex together the night before Kay was murdered. For detectives, once they learn all of this, it's like you could see the light bulbs going off in their heads. They had uncovered the connection between all of it, and they now knew that Rebecca Sears had a motive to kill Kay Parsons. With this smoking gun, detectives now sat down for an official interview with Rebecca Sears, and although she somewhat tried to take the blame off herself, she broke down very easily and confessed to everything. Rebecca told the detectives that during her affair with David, she frequently spoke with her 19-year-old son, Christopher, about the relationship. She said they frequently had conversations and she would tell him uh, how badly she wanted to be with David and that she wanted David to be Christopher's stepdad. And then she goes on to say that after they finished having phone sex the night before Kay's death, if you remember, David was in California and, she, and 
and Rebecca was at home. So when they got done having phone sex, she hung up with him and she immediately began talking to her son Christopher about how nothing in this world was going to make her happy unless she could be with David Parsons. So then Rebecca tells law enforcement that on the morning of Kay's death, she left to go take her younger kids to school. And when she came home, her son Christopher was standing in her home covered in blood. And he told her that he took care of everything. She later said that Christopher told her that he beat the F out of her. The detectives didn't buy the story completely, though, and they wholeheartedly believed that Rebecca Sears was so madly in love with David Parsons that she actually either did it or she put her son up to it. Either way, after Christopher bludgeoned Kay Parsons to death with that hammer and the baseball bat, he then went through her home, tossing everything on the floor, making it look like a robbery. While doing this, he stumbled across her jewelry cabinet and he grabbed the gold necklace and the watch and he took them thinking that it would like add to their robbery setup. And then one day down in the future, he may be able to sell them after all of it blows over and get a few extra bucks in his pocket. Once Rebecca got back home and found Christopher standing there in her home bloody, she said that he cleaned up and he changed his clothes. She said that they loaded up all of his bloody clothes that he was wearing into a box and then they got in the car and they drove away to go throw them out. After they did this, they then quickly drove back home and that's when they saw the construction worker at the Parsons. So they both went over there to check and see if he had seen anything or not. But by the time they had got to him, he had already called police. Rebecca and Christopher started panicking. Even though the cops weren't looking for them, they tell law enforcement that they began panicking and they were paranoid, so they trashed their own home, making it look like another robbery. And then they called the police again, hoping that the police wouldn't suspect them because the same thing happened to them except for the death. After law enforcement left their home, they settled down somewhat but then again, several days later, Rebecca begins to get paranoid. The silence is what got her. It's like that old saying, curiosity killed the cat. Because the detectives were investigating and they really weren't saying anything publicly and they weren't saying anything to her, it was just silence as they investigated behind the scenes, Rebecca begins to become paranoid. So Rebecca has no idea what's going on in the investigation. And she again drives herself nuts thinking that they're suspecting she had something to do with this. Because Rebecca is so paranoid, she decides to take it to the next level. So she gets her son Christopher a firearm and she sets up the whole attack outside of her work where the person shot her in the leg demanding money. That was Christopher Bowers wearing a hoodie the whole time. Rebecca spent most of her entire interview throwing her own son under the bus and blaming him for everything. That's mind-boggling to me that a mother would do that to her own son, but... Once this interview with Rebecca is over, of course, she's immediately arrested and booked into the Columbia County Jail for murder. Investigators then go after Christopher, and he too is brought in for an interview. At first, he asks for a lawyer, and he's not going to say anything. I want to speak to a lawyer right now. But very quickly, over the course of a few different interviews, he also begins to break down. And he tells them everything, but he tells them that it was all his mom's idea. He, he says that... Rebecca got him to do it so that she could marry David. That way, taking the choice away from him because David was going to choose Kay. And Rebecca didn't like that. Rebecca wanted to be with David. So if Kay was out of the picture, she was left. Immediately following Christopher's interview, he was also arrested and booked into the Columbia County Jail for murder. Law enforcement had search warrants in hand already, and it allowed them to take pictures of Christopher. They were able to fingerprint him, and they eventually matched his fingerprints up with the bloody fingerprints found inside of the Parsons' home. He had no criminal record prior to this, which is why it didn't show up in their database before. Detectives actually talked to Rebecca's other children, and one of them actually came out and said that it, on at least one occasion, Rebecca Sears had said to them that she wished Kay was dead but none of Rebecca's other children 
were arrested or charged with anything, and neither was David Parsons. He had nothing to do with this besides cheating on his wife with a crazy woman. In fact, he told the, the investigators that, that he was gonna choose Kay over Rebecca. He was gonna tell Rebecca that he didn't want to keep up with this relationship anymore, that he wanted to stay with Kay. And I guess for him, it was just a sexual thing between him and Rebecca Sears. And it was obviously the complete opposite for Rebecca and she fell head over heels in love with him. It had actually gotten to the point where David actually convinced Kay that they needed to sell their house and move just so that they could get away from Rebecca and this affair that he had had for the last few years. That's how much he was gonna choose Kay. And Rebecca knew this and that's what set her off. It's just unfortunate that Kay Parsons had to pay the ultimate price for David's unfaithfulness which he's gonna to have to live with for the rest of his life, knowing that had he not been unfaithful to Kay with his neighbor and her best friend, Kay would still be alive to this day. In May of 2012, both Rebecca Sears and Christopher Bowers would have their day in court. One thing that anyone who was close to this case pointed out was how much different Rebecca Sears looked in court versus that suburban mom look that she had at the time of her arrest. She had gained a ton of weight and she was almost unrecognizable. As their trials got closer and closer, Christopher was gonna go first. And because they were basically pitted against each other, they were tried separately and they each had their own defense attorneys. Both of the attorneys for Rebecca and Christopher, they were hoping that one of them, one or the other, would take a plea deal and agree to testify against the other one for a better sentence. For a long time, they both held out, intending to individually fight these charges, but just before Christopher's trial, and I mean right before, within like the final month, Rebecca Sears would shock everyone, and she came forward and told investigators that she had kept the box of bloody clothes Christopher took off right after he killed Kay Parsons. And Rebecca tells law enforcement that she will tell them where it is at. Detectives went to Rebecca's mother's house and they retrieved a box from up in her mother's attic exactly where she told them it would be and inside of the box they found all the bloody clothes that Chris had worn on the day of the attack and they found the several pieces of jewelry that had been reported missing from both houses from both the Parsons home and the Sears home. Now investigators believed this revelation that she shared was one last attempt on her part to get the murder charges dropped against her while simultaneously digging her own son's grave even deeper. Again, it's just mind boggling to me that a mother would throw her own child under the bus like Rebecca Sears did here. In the end, it didn't work though, and she just gave them even more evidence to use against them. Her charges were not dropped, and because both of them were facing the death penalty for the savage murder, and I guess neither one of them wanted to meet the same fate that Kay Parsons met, they both feared that they would get the death penalty, so they finally both took plea deals, like the day before their trials. They both pled guilty in open court to murder, armed robbery, and burglary. Now, the plea deals meant that they wouldn't get a needle in their arm, but they were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. They both got life with parole for the armed robbery, and then they both got 20 years for burglary, all to be served consecutively. And that really doesn't matter because the life without parole, they'll never be released from prison and they will never have a, a chance to serve that life with parole for the armed robbery. The story isn't quite over yet, because after Rebecca Sears' arrest, the owner of the physical therapy center where Rebecca and Kay worked, the owner of that physical therapy center decided to do an audit to make sure Rebecca didn't have access to any more of their accounts or anything like that. And it wasn't until this point that he was able to follow the breadcrumbs and put all the pieces together, and he uncovered that for years, Rebecca had been stealing money from him there is no total it was a ridiculous amount of money i mean the owner said he has actually no clue what the total amount is but it was a lot after it was all said and done kay parsons was taken back up to pennsylvania where she was from with her family where she was laid to rest in a beautiful ceremony 
that she should have never had. I mean, let's face it, she should still be alive to this day. This this whole thing is just just completely tragic. That is going to do it for this episode, this story today from here in Augusta, Georgia and the murder of Laverne K. Parsons. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, hit that subscribe button, then hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. Thank you all. I will see you again in the next one. Please, all of you, stay safe and stay healthy. Much love to you all.